the book of Nehemiah, this Old Testament prophet Nehemiah, two passages beginning with Nehemiah chapter 6. Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. If it helps, it's after Ezra. If it don't help, just fake it and look up at the screen. Amen. <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. If you have it, say amen. I'm going to ask you to put your finger there and go to Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. I'm going to read these passages out of order. I'm going to read the reading from chapter 6 first. And then I'm going to read the reading from chapter 2. And we're going to answer the question, is there a word from the Lord? In the book of Nehemiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, and it reads, Now it came to pass, when Sambalat, Tobias, and Geshem, the Arabian, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall, that there was no breach left therein, though at the time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, that Sambalad and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a good work. Somebody shout, a good work. Good work. So that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease? Why, I leave it and come down to you. Ooh, that's powerful right there. And verse 4 says, Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. In chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, it reads, And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, the king that wine was brought before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance, or why is thy face sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid, and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should my countenance why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lies waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? And the king said unto me, For what doest thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And shall we read verse 5 together? And I said unto the king, If it please the king, if thy servant hath found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the cities of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit that has already saturated this place. Now, Father, I thank you for you just are a good God. Father, I thank you for the things that you've already done in my life. I thank you for the things that you're doing right now, and I'm going to thank you in advance for what you're going to do on tomorrow. But well, Father, you're the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, which means if you did it yesterday, you can do more than the same thing today. So Father, I thank you. I thank you those who open up their mouth to tell you thank you. I thank you for being a blessing in somebody else's life to remind me that it is no secret what you can do. If you can do it for somebody else, you do the same thing for me. I thank you that while I was sleeping, you were wide awake fighting devils, fighting demons, fighting giants. Lord, I thank you that the devil that should have killed me yesterday was defeated. I, Lord, I thank you for everything that you have done, everything that you're doing. Now use me in this moment to declare a word from you. Father, I can do nothing without you, that I can do all things through you. Father, I pray for your strength. I pray for your endurance. It's in Jesus' name we do pray, and everyone say it together, amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Turn to your neighbor, grab somebody by the hand, look at them like you're angry, but please smile when you do, and say, neighbor, amen. pray for the preacher. 
He's going to talk about a lesson from Nehemiah. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, as you can see, my sinuses has kept me up all night, and I got to preach twice today, but God is able, so y'all give me some amens, all right? Uh, last week, Salem, we examined the story of Jairus and his daughter, how he came to Jesus in a point of desperation because his daughter was at the point of death. And as Jesus traveled to his home, he received the message that his daughter had already died. But Jesus spoke unto him and declared, Be not afraid, only believe. It seems as if things went from bad to worse. Jesus said, Don't be afraid, only believe. The power of that story is twofold. First of all, it reveals that just because it looks like it's over, somebody should have said amen right there. Just because it looks like it's over does not mean it's over. The second thing is God always finishes what he starts. Um, the book of Nehemiah speaks of this second revelation. When God created man, Moses reveals in the book of Genesis that he created man in his own image. And so we are created, if we are created in the image of of God, then we ought to be a reflection of him. Just like I'm a reflection of my father. I take on some of his physical characteristics, but I also take on some of his emotional characteristics. I take uh, things in my body, I take the way I think, all of that becomes a reflection of my father. Y'all with me here? And so if we are in a of God, then we ought to reflect him. Everything God creates is a reflection on some level of his character and his attributes. The world is orderly. The world is not in chaos. The world operates by process and by order. And Paul declares God is not the author of confusion. Oh, I wish I had a witness here. Uh, creation operates through process. Trees and uh, plants bear seeds after their own kind. And Abraham, through your seed shall all the nations of the world be blessed. And so quickly, we see two aspects of God that are clearly visible in his creation. Therefore, if a man, if we are to be created in the images of God, then two aspects of our lives that should be a reflection of God, it should be the order of our lives, and it should be the process of our lives. I knew I wasn't going to get an amen, but I'm going to get you in a minute here. In other words, our lives ought to be a reflection of God by your priorities. I got quiet right there. If you want to be a reflection of God, there ought to be some kind of order in your life. If you want to be a reflection of God, you got to know what comes first in your life. For the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will what? Be added unto you. If you want to be a reflection of God, your life ought to have some order to it. The second thing is that if we're going to reflect God, we reflect him through the process of our lives. For Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says, being confident of this very thing, he which has began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. Don't miss this. If you want to be a reflection of God, because you are made in the image of God, if you want your life to be a reflection of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the God whom you serve, this is one quality you must have. You got to finish what you start. Somebody ought to wake up and talk to me here. If you want to be a reflection of God, you have to learn how to finish what you start. Somebody say, finish what you start. How many things have you started? And how many things have you finished? Somebody ought to wake up and talk to me here. Uh, don't get quiet. I'm going to get everybody this morning here. Uh, how many things have we started and how many things we have finished? These are two different issues because starting and finishing does not require the same qualities or characteristics. It takes motivation to start something but it takes commitment to finish what you start. Uh, it, it takes a thought to start something, but it takes endurance to finish what you start. It, it takes little effort to start something, but it takes blood, sweat, and tears to finish. Somebody gonna wake up and talk to me here. 
Uh, if you want to be a reflection of God, you must understand that everything God starts, he finishes. If God starts something, he's going to finish it. Oh, I wish I had a praying church here. Uh, John in Revelation, he is Jesus referring to himself that Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end, which lets me know if God starts something, he's going to finish it. I wish I had a praying church here. God, God said, I'm Alpha and Omega. I'm Genesis and I'm also Revelation. Anything I start, I'm going to finish. If I woke you up this morning, that's your start. Oh, I wish I had a praying church here. Yeah. If, if, I, if I gave you a job, that's the start. Everything God starts, he finishes. If, if God started me on my way this morning, then God is going to finish. I wish I had a praying church. Everything God starts, he finishes. I wish I had a witness. That's what I love about God. Everything he starts, he finishes. John says he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, which means everything starts with God. And everything ends with God. Because he's the Alpha and the Omega, it reveals two things about him. First of all, it reveals that he is not controlled, nor is he bound by time. God has no concept of the past or the future. God doesn't even know anything about time because God is the one who started time moving. God says, I stand outside of time. But the only way, the best way to understand it is through anthropopathic language when he tells us that I am that I am. In other words, I don't live in yesterday. I don't live in tomorrow. I live in uh, right now. Because God stands outside of time, he tells Moses, I am that I am. In other words, the best way for you to understand who God is, is if I tell you I only live in right now. Malachi says God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. God is not bound by time, Salem, but we are. God lives outside of time, but we live in time. And when we relate to God, Brother Fuller, sometimes it's difficult because we live in time and God lives outside of time. And sometimes when God speaks to us, we have to be careful because he is talking about us now and we think and he's talking about something he's going to do tomorrow. Somebody ought to wake up and talk to me here. Oh, why, why let me give you a biblical example. He looks at Simon Peter and says, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build a my church. Now at that time, Peter called Simon was the most unstable person you could imagine. But Jesus calls him a rock. Peter is not a rock yet. He's going to be a rock later on after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But Jesus doesn't say you will be a rock. He does not say you will mature into Peter. But he says thou art Peter, somebody ought to pray with me here. What I'm trying to get you to understand, God does not deal with yesterday, so you have to be careful. If God is going to bless you tomorrow, he has already blessed you today. If God is going to do something for you tomorrow, he's already done it. All you have to do is to catch up to what God has already done. Am I making sense this morning here? Let me give you an example. When A few weeks ago when you prepared for Thanksgiving, those who went shopping, you went down the aisle in your basket and you had a frozen turkey in your basket. You had some cornbread in your basket. You had all this stuff in your basket. And, and as you look at your basket, you didn't see no frozen turkey. You didn't see no cranberry sauce. You saw your dinner on your table. Somebody ought to wake up and talk to me here. And you kept on shopping until what was in your basket matched what was going to be on your table. Somebody ought to pray with me here. You ain't cooked nothing yet. But when you look at what's in your basket, you already see your table. Somebody ought to wake up and talk to me here. What I'm trying to get you to understand, it may not look like what you want right now. But when God looks at your life, he's going to talk about it like it's already put together. I wish I had a witness here. So when God begins to look at my life and I look, my life is in it repair. It looks disarray. God is saying, I'm going to call those things that are not as though they were. So that they might become. You got to learn to call yourself how you're going to be, not as who you are right now. I got news for you. That's why I tell you, I'm never broke. I'm never broke. Y'all gonna give me in a minute. I say, I'm never broke. Why? Because I work. 
And why? Because I got a check coming. I ain't got it yet, but I'm never broke. Because I know I got, y'all gonna get me in a minute. I got some, I got some income coming. I, I may not have it right now, but I'm not broke. Because in a few days, I got a check. Oh, I wish I had a witness here. That's why I don't care what you're going through, you can still have a smile on your face. I don't care how bad your life would be, you can still say hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Because God is going to, I wish, I, I'm gonna, I, got, I got to preach one more time, I got to take my time here. It, it's, it's the thought, it's with this thought, that's why you are never to allow your present to dictate your future. Never allow your present to dictate your future. You ought to allow your future to interpret your present. That, this is the thought that we approach the book of Nehemiah. That's why I read chapter 6 first. Because when you know how it's going to end, you can better interpret how it starts. Uh, in chapter 6, Nehemiah is about to complete the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. And, and, and he is faced with extreme opposition from a man by the name of Samballat, Tobias, and Geshem. Uh, and in chapter 1, we see Nehemiah serving as the king's cupbearer. Because in 586 B.C., the, the nation of Judah was captured by the Babylonians. And the Babylonians, they began to take all of the treasures out of Israel. They destroyed the temple. They destroyed the capital city. They put everybody into exile. They put everybody into subjection. And then Belshazzar had a great feast. And you remember he ran out of plates, so he took the holy vessels from the temple and began to eat off of them. And he saw a hand writing in the wall, many, many tekel, you for sin, you have been weighed in the balances and be found wanting. At that very night, the Medes and the Persian walked through the waterways of the, the city. Babylonian was destroyed and the Medes and the Persian took over because the Persians were stronger than the Medes. We have Persia taking over the Median Empire and now we got Nehemiah in the service of King Adazerti. I just want to know I studied right along in there. Right here. And so Nehemiah is a cupbearer for the king. He's a servant. He's a slave working as a cupbearer for the king and it appears to be a very tragic story. For Jerusalem is destroyed. Nehemiah is a servant. And so Nehemiah's position in chapter 2 does not, is not only tragic, but it appears to be a dead end. It looks like he'll never advance. It looks like he'll never get out of it. He's going to be a servant to the day he dies. But if you examine his presence through the lens of his future, you will see that his present position was not tragic, but it was strategic. Because he was next to the king, he had access to resources. Uh, when he discovers the conditions of Jerusalem, he goes to the king's presence in a very sad, emotional state. And the only reason the king notices it, Brother Coleman, is because Nehemiah was not a sad person. Now, Nehemiah is a servant, but he had never been sad in the king's presence. Y'all going to get me in a minute. His kingdom, his homeland has been destroyed. He's a servant, but he has never been sad in the king's presence. And so the king looks at Nehemiah in a state of sadness and, and depression and says, what's wrong with you? Because I know something is wrong that you're not sick, so it must be that your heart is breaking. Simply, Nehemiah was normally happy. And, and this, this is crazy because if you look at Nehemiah's life, Salem, he don't have much to be happy about. The kingdom, his house is destroyed. He's a servant. He can't, he can't go where he wants to. He can't do what he wants to. But Nehemiah does not allow his situation uh, to make him fall into depression uh, and giving up with hopelessness. I want to get you to understand, just because you're going through a bad time. Oh, somebody missed that point right there. Well, culturally, 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 servants were not supposed to be sad in the king's presence. They're supposed to maintain a jovial spirit. But in Nehemiah's case, his attitude was a reflection of his relationship with God. And he, he served the king. He understood that he was unable to change his situation. But he knew who could change it. He was unable to get himself out of bondage. 
but he knew who could. He was unable to change his own situation, but he knew who hold the world in the palm of his hand. In other words, because he viewed his situation through the lens of the providence of God, he was able to smile. Providence simply means when you know God will make it happen. I wish I had a witness. Providence is when you can look at your life and say, I don't care what's going on, the Lord can make a way somehow. Providence is when you can look at a tragedy in your life and say, yes, it's bad, but all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord. Providence is when God, you do know God can make a mess and make a miracle, don't you? You do know God can take trouble and make it triumph. You do know God can turn victim into a victor. You do know God can turn cancer into a celebration. You do know God can turn your life around. Right here, Nehemiah said, I don't have to be sad because my God is in control. Nehemiah teaches me that just because you're going through hell don't mean you got to look like somebody ought to pray with me. Just because I'm going through it. Somebody should have shouted right there. Just because I'm going through it don't mean I have to look like it. I got news for you. You'll never know how bad my life is because every morning I'm going to get up. I'm going to put my best clothes on. I'm going to step out with a smile on my face because I don't need nobody having pity on me for nothing because my God is a good God. And he's worthy to be praised. God is good all the time. And all the time God is. Somebody ought to shout with me right now. Mm. It bothers me when you got church folk who got more complaints than they got praise. It seems like they wake up and say, drive to church, say, sit in church, say. I wish I had a witness here. But I just want to say, my, if you that sad, why don't you just stay at home? I wish I had a witness here. But I came to tell somebody, you got to learn how to smile in the midst of your trouble. If you're going to get through life, you got to learn how to give God praise even when everything is falling apart. I wish I had a witness here. I tell you, you never know if the three Hebrew boys can spend a night in a fire. And when they come out, the king say they don't even smell like smoke. And that means I don't have to look like what I'm going through. I wish I had a witness here. Oh, let me tell you, let me tell you. I don't have to, whatever I'm going through in life, I don't have to look like it. I don't have to smell like it. I don't have to act like it. I don't have to think like it. I don't have to talk like it. I don't have to dream like it. I don't have to, do you? Oh, I wish I had a shouting church right in here. You don't have to look like what's going on in your life because now I realize being a cup bearer was not Nehemiah's problem. It was Nehemiah's position. And there's a difference between a problem and a position. Oh, can I preach right along in here? If, if, if it was a problem, then that means I believe God can use me where he's put me. I wish I had a witness here. If your job is a problem, that means you believe God can use you where he put you. So, somebody ought to wake up and talk to me here. If, if, if it's a problem, then, then, then you'll fall into hopelessness. But, but, but it's a position when I believe that all things work together for the good of them who love the Lord. Salem, I came to ask somebody where you are, is it a problem or is it your position? Oh, can I preach right along in here? If it's a problem, that means you don't have much hope. But if it's a position, you can have hope because you know God will never put you in any position where he cannot bless you. I wish I had a witness here. If, I, I don't know about you, but, but I know God will never set his child up to fail in any situation. And so wherever God places me, that means God can bless me right where he places me. Have I got a witness here? 
And that's why, if it's your position, you can have hope because you know God will never place you where he cannot bless you. I love it when, the David, when David says, where can I go from the presence of God? If I take the wings of the morning and fly in the uttermost parts of the sea, thou art there. But he goes a little closer, Brother, Brother Coleman, he said, if I make my bed in hell, there you are. I came to tell you there is no place that you can go that God is not already there. I don't have to pray God to meet me nowhere. I be God because God is everywhere at the same time. Have I got a witness here? You don't have to send God to the hospital. He's already there. You ain't got to send him to Big Mama's house. He's already there. You don't have to send him to your job. He's already there. And the truth is, he's already there, and he's waiting on you to catch up with where he is. Right here in the text here, it says he's a cupbearer, but he, he's in a secular position. And the Bible says his position was not a problem. It was his position because notice what the king says. When Nehemiah tells the king what's going on, the king says, well, what do you want? Ooh, that made me shout right there. Here it is. The king says, Nehemiah, what do you want? Uh, and Nehemiah said, well, let me pray about this thing here. This statement is powerful because, watch this, Salem, it reveals God can use a secular position to fulfill a spiritual purpose. Somebody should have shouted right there. I said, God can use a secular position to fulfill a spiritual purpose. A cupbearer is a secular position. But rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem was a spiritual purpose. Therefore, for Nehemiah to fulfill his spiritual purpose, God placed him in a secular position. That's why, watch this, don't miss this, Salem. Wherever God places you, you need to be faithful. Somebody should have shouted right there. Wherever God places you, you need to be faithful where you are. This is why Nehemiah refuses to come down uh, from the wall in chapter 6 because his blessing was tied up in his position. Salem, you must understand what the enemy is really after. The enemy is not after your position. He's after your blessing. And Satan knows your blessing is wrapped up in your position. I wish I had a witness here. And then let me see if, I can, see if I can make you understand here. He's not after your position. He's after your blessing because Satan knows God is in control of your blessing. And he knows that if God is in control of it, can't nobody take it away from you. What God has for you, it is for you. Now watch this. If Satan cannot steal your blessing, but you can forfeit your blessing. Somebody missed that right there. Satan can't steal it, but you can give it up. If you get out of position, then you will give up your blessing. Satan cannot steal it, but you can give it up. And if you give up your position, then you give up your blessing. And that's why Nehemiah says, I cannot come down. Somebody tell your neighbor, don't come down. Don't come down. Notice your enemies always want you to come down. I said, your enemies always want you to come down. I said, your enemies always want you to come down. Your enemies always want you to come down. A friend will want you to come up, but an enemy will want you to come down. Somebody who loves you wants you to come up, but somebody that don't like you will want you to come down. I wish I had a witness here. He says, come down. Notice your enemies always want you to come down because that's where they are. You got to understand your enemies are never on your level. Your enemies are always beneath you. And so because your enemies can't come up to you, they want you to come down to them. I wish I had a witness here. He declares, I cannot come down. That's a word for somebody today. Don't come down because your position is tied up in your blessing. A Christian has no business fighting down. A Christian, a child of God, has no business lowering your standards to engage anybody. I tell you before and I tell you again, you'll never see an eagle fighting a chicken. Because a chicken cannot operate on an eagle's level. 
An eagle would say, I ain't got to fight with you. I just fly above you, and you can't come up to where I am. I wish I had a witness here. And so I want to know, do I got a church full of chickens, or do I got a church full of eagles? If I got a church full of eagles, then chicken stuff shouldn't bother you. If I got a church full of eagles, if folk don't talk to you, they shouldn't bother you. If I got a church full of eagles, and somebody didn't shake your hand this morning, that shouldn't bother you. That's chicken stuff. I wish I had a witness here. There's a difference between chicken stuff and eagle stuff. If it don't affect the kingdom of God, that's chicken stuff. And an eagle don't fight on a chicken's level. And a chicken can't fight on an eagle's level. I wish I had a witness here. That's why your enemies should not scare you. Because they ain't on your level. Why would I be afraid of somebody that can't operate on the level I'm operating on? But your only recourse is to get me to come down to where you are. But I came to tell you like Nehemiah, I won't come down. I wish I had a witness here. Yo, oh, you can cuss at me, but I ain't gonna cuss back. Not all the time. Hallelujah. I ain't made it to that level yet. Eh? But if you're an eagle, chicken stuff don't bother you. It amazes me how many people give up because of chicken stuff. It don't go my way, so I give up. They ain't going to wear my color, so I give up. They ain't going to sing my song, I ain't going to give up. But I came to tell you, Jesus don't deal with chicken. Jesus hangs around eagles. If you're going to be around an eagle, you don't have to fight everything, but you pray about everything. If you're an eagle, then it don't matter if they don't sing your song. You can still make a joyful noise unto the Lord. It don't matter if nobody else is saying nothing. If you're an eagle, you can open up your own mouth and make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Right here, that's why it says God can give you a secular position to fulfill a spiritual purpose. That's why the Bible says, give and it shall be given good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over. That's a spiritual principle. But in order to fulfill it, God give me a secular position. And through that position, I'm able to give to the church tithes and offering, which grants me access to my spiritual purpose. If you don't believe me, just ask Joseph. Joseph was put in charge of all the food in Egypt. That was a secular position. But through it, he saved all of Egypt, Israel, and his whole family. That was a spiritual purpose. The lesson is Salem God can use position. Immediately, he makes his request, and the king gives him a very unique opportunity. He says he can base his request on what he thinks is necessary to start the rebuilding of the walls. The king said, well, just ask me anything that you want. Nehemiah could have thought, well, I need so much wood to get started. Or he could base his request on what he thinks he needs to complete the rebuilding of the walls. Or he can base his request on the resources of the king. To understand this, Salem, you must understand the first two possibilities are based on the unknown. Nehemiah really does not know how much he needs to get started. Nor does he know how much he needs to complete the journey. But he does know the resources of the king. And so when the king asked him, what do you want? He could either base his response upon what he does not know or on what he does know. I'm getting to the hyphen part right here. The text said, give me letters to the Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest. Nehemiah, brother Coleman, needed some wood. But the king had a forest. Nehemiah needed some wood to build the walls. But the king had a forest. Y'all gonna get me in a minute. Nehemiah had a need for wood. But the king had a forest. Y'all gonna get me in a minute. Maybe somebody over know that. Nehemiah had a need for wood. But the king had a forest. Y'all gonna, y'all ain't praying with me here. Nehemiah needed some wood. But the king had 
Maybe the ushers know what I'm talking about. Nehemiah needed some wood. But the king had, I, let me try this one more time. Nehemiah had need for some wood. But the king had a whole forest. Salem, I came to tell you, stop praying for little stuff. I wish I had a witness there. Nehemiah needed wood, but he didn't pray for some wood because he knew the king had a forest. I wish I had a witness here. I came to tell somebody in 2017, you've been asking God for wood. But don't you know God got a forest? You've been asking God for little. And don't you know God got everything? I got news for you. I base my request on the one that I'm talking to. And I do know that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that I can ask or think. This is important because he had a job that he wanted to finish. And he knew the only way to finish it was to start it with more than enough. Salem, simply when you have the keys to a forest, you don't have to worry about running out of wood. Salem, I came to tell somebody that's why God never failed because he knows the end from the beginning. God knows Genesis from Revelation because it's what it because it's you want to know where to start then you got to look at where you want to finish. What I love about God Salem is that God finishes everything he starts. He was born in Bethlehem, wrapped up in a manger. Didn't have a place to lay his head. But God starts what he finished. He was 12 years old and Mary and Joseph lost him in Jerusalem. And they found him in the temple talking with the doctors of the law. God starts what he finished. He appears at 30 years old on the banks of the Jordan River. John says, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. God starts what he finished. He went to the temple one day and overturned the tables and kicked out the money changers. And he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. I said, Jesus starts what he finished. Uh, well, the Bible says he was walking out of Jericho and met a blind man by the name of Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus healed the blind man, but Jesus finishes what he starts. He met a woman with an issue of blood that touched the hem of his garment. Jesus stopped and said, thy faith has made you whole. But Jesus finishes what he starts. One day he was crucified on Calvary. He hung, bled, and died. That was fried. But Jesus finishes what he starts. He stayed dead all Saturday night. But early Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hand. He said, I am he that was dead. But behold, I'm alive forevermore. He finishes what he starts. Well, he appeared to 500 people. He went up to glory in Acts chapter 1. The Spirit came in Acts chapter 2. He gave us deacons in Acts chapter 7. He opened the doors to the Gentiles in chapter 9 and 10. But I came to tell you when I get to the book of Revelation, time that has been won't be no more. We're going to have church for the last time. We're going to preach for the last time. We're going to sing for the last time. And we're going to be caught up to meet him somewhere in the middle of the air. Because God finishes everything he starts. Salem, if your life is going to be a reflection of God, it must have order. It must have order. You got to know how to put first things first. And that's the key to everything else. It operates by process. Things don't happen overnight. You got to learn how to finish what you start. Too many times today, people start, but they don't finish. They'll start a marriage, 
but they won't finish. They'll start a child, but they won't finish. They'll start church, but they won't finish. But if you're going to be a reflection of God, you got to finish what you start. And Nehemiah teaches us this morning that when you are doing a good work, I don't come down because an eagle has no business down with chicken. Think about it.